Thank you everyone for finding my talk. My name is Charles Griego and I'm a fourth year PhD student working for Professor John Keith. I'd like to thank AICHE and the organizers for giving me this platform to speak today. And I'll be giving an update on our group's work with alchemical perturbation density functional theory or APDFT for short. A great challenge is finding alternative technology for chemical production that also relies on renewable resources. This includes processes like ammonia synthesis, CO2 conversion of fuels, and hydrogen production. We can search for catalysts that enable these processes through accurate screening studies based on density functional theory calculations. However, one challenge is to be able to model many adsorbates binding at different coverages on different facets on countless compositions of hypothetical alloys. Let's consider a common descriptor that we calculate using DFT, the binding energy. Normally we take these three systems here where we have a slab, an adsorbate, and both together, and we evaluate all three of DFT and calculate the binding energy. However, there's a problem, and that is when we start with these three calculations, and for every ca catalyst where we want a new binding energy, these numbers increase more and more. And this can be a problem for large scale screening studies, and big data applications, and machine learning and catalysis research because we want to obtain all this data, but it's expensive to try to do this with just DFT. So here I'd like to introduce alchemical perturbation density functional theory, APDFT, as a way to generate many predictions on many compositions of catalyst alloys. What we do with this method is consider a reference binding energy calculation on a simple reference catalyst, such as the one on the top. And if we figure out how to calculate the way the binding energy changes when some perturbation is made to our reference, such as one of the atoms on the surface being transmuted to another atom that's a neighbor on the periodic table, we can approximate this perturbation using this Taylor series expansion here on the bottom. Here though, we're only considering first order approximations. So we can reduce all higher order terms. And after that, we're left with this first order derivative, which is a function of the sum of the difference in electrostatic potentials based on the adsorption mu, which also depends on the variation of nuclear charge caused by the perturbation n. With this expression, we can calculate the binding energy change. And we're able to do this by making two assumptions. First, our transmutations are done isoelectronically so that the number of electrons is fixed. And second, the positions of atoms are fixed after these changes. Next, let me show you how we use APDFT to generate lots of binding energy data for many alloys. First, we take a reference binding energy calculation, such as this one illustrated, and we evaluate all of it in VASP. Next, conveniently from VASP, we're able to obtain atom-centered electrostatic potentials. And we map each of these to each atom and construct an array shown here. We take the electrostatic potential values for the clean catalyst and the catalyst of the adsorbate, and we take the difference and get this array here on the right with electrostatic potential differences due to the adsorption. Now we have all the information we need from a single set of DFT calculations, and we can make countless predictions and generate a lot of data of binding energies on hypothetical alloy catalysts. The next step is to hypothesize these catalysts, and we do so like this. So here we have our reference catalyst in the middle, pure platinum. And we record the atomic number of every atom in this slab, uh, in the array here in the middle. Then we make any transmutations that we wish, and now we re-record all of these atomic numbers um, in this alloy slab in the array below it. With these now, we can take a difference, and now we have a new array that shows where the transmutations occur. And this gives us the second term. Finally, we can calculate our first order derivative by taking the dot product of our two arrays. And with this, we now have the change in binding energy. And now with this, we are able to make countless binding energy predictions on many hypothetical alloys, simply using arithmetic and only using a single set of DFT calculations. So here we have an example. And in this case, we have OH binding on a slab of pure platinum 
And we've hypothesized 32 variations where we've transmuted platinum to both are either gold or iridium. And here on the right, we have a parity plot showing APDFT binding energy predictions versus the benchmark DFT predictions. And we can see that overall APDFT agrees well with DFT. Now, if we look at the distance of the transmutation site from the adsorbate, we result in these different uh, sizes of the data points here, where if we have small radiuses, these are sites close to the adsorbate. And we can see that these fall farther from the parity line compared to those that are bigger, which represent sites farther from the adsorbate. So from this, we can conclude that in this case, AVDFT agrees well with DFT, but we do see that the errors increase when we make a transmutation close to the adsorbate. Now, we'd be able to gain more insight if we evaluate these predictions with more reference systems where we have more adsorbates and more hypothetical alloys. So what we do next is take reference systems where we have CHX, NHX, and OHX adsorbates, where X is the number of hydrogens around the central atom, and we consider them binding to alloys of platinum at multiple coverages. And then, so we take these many alloy variations where we can make up to NT transmutations up to four and consider nuclear charge changes of delta Z up to plus or minus three. And so here we have parity plots for these three data sets where we can see that there are cases that agree well with DFT and cases that do not. Now with this, we would like to break down some of these cases by certain variables and really try to pinpoint where the shortcomings are with these predictions. And so here we have separated the data based on different features and we have these bar charts where we have the mean absolute error plotted with respect to NT and also delta Z. And we have these three separate plots showing the data separated based on the adsorbate coverage. First off, we can see that these errors increase both with NT and also with delta Z. And when we increase coverage, we can also see these errors increase. Furthermore, we can look at the relationship of the errors with respect to the type of adsorbate. And so here we have errors plotted for each set of adsorbates where each color represents the number of hydrogenation around the central atom. We can see that we have errors decreasing when this hydrogenation in in increases. So to conclude, from this we can see that these errors in APDFT predictions have systematic trends with respect to these features. And this suggests that we can train machine learning models based on these features to predict these errors. So here I will walk you through our workflow we developed for machine learning corrected APDFT predictions. So first we start with an input, which is just a hypothetical alloy made from transmutations to a reference surface catalyst. And so we have an example here where we have a three by three unit cell of NH absorbed on a platinum alloy where we have a top view of the first layer on the left and the top view of the second layer on the right. Now we can fingerprint these changes by assigning a one to any transmuted site and a zero to any of those that were not transmuted. From there, we record these fingerprints and also the delta Z of the change, the number of changes, the adsorbate type, the coverage, et cetera. Then once we have a model built, we can feed this input feature vector into our model, and the model will predict the error between the APDFT prediction of the binding energy and the DFT prediction. And with this error, we can apply it to the raw APDFT prediction as a correction and obtain our corrected form. So in our model building procedure, we assessed several different model types, and we found that the one that gave the best accuracy for predictions for all of our data sets and so here in this case, we found a support vector regression model with an RBF kernel to perform the best. And here we have an example of our CHX data set where we have the original predictions here on the left and now the predictions after ML corrections. And we can see that the mean absolute error has improved significantly. And so from this, we can see that these machine learning corrections are able to improve these errors by up to an order of magnitude. Next, we show how we're able to train machine learning models that predict with greater accuracy using a smaller data set made up of this APDFT-based data. We do this by comparing 
models trained with APDFT-based data, and then simply DFT-based data. And we look at these learning curves here on the right, where for the cases of CHX and OHX, we're able to achieve better accuracy with a smaller data set trained with just APDFT-based data compared to a data set that has DFT data. And then here in the bottom for NHX, we're able to get greater or equal accuracy. And so from this then, we can see that by using training sets where we have these APDFT deviations from DFT, we're able to train more accurate models with smaller data sets. Next, we can evaluate our models further by looking at the importance of the features. So here we have a univariate score plotted for each feature where one is most important and zero is least important. We can see that the top two features are the delta Z and the NT. And the least important feature is the choice in the transmutation site. This was initially surprising because we believe that the choice of this site showed great importance in the accuracy of the prediction. However, since there are many sites that we can choose from to transmute in the surface, and there are only select few that are close to the absorbate, which lead to higher errors. Though while we're considering high delta Z or high NT predictions, all of the data within that particular data set will have larger errors and will be more common. From this, we investigated the performance of our models by the type of alloys in our data set. So here on the right, we have this plot where we have all of these circles representing a data set for alloys made from a certain delta Z and NT combination. Each of these circles are sized differently, where the size of the radius represents how many alloys of this type were in our training sets. We can see that as we go up in NT, these circles get larger. This is because with the combinatorics of more numbers of transmutations, there are more alloys that result. These circles are also colored based on the level of improvement to the mean absolute error that machine learning gave to these binding energy predictions on alloys of this type. And what we can see is that as we go from higher NT and higher delta Z, we get greater improvement in mean absolute error up to one EV. So from this, we can see that we can train these models on many binding energy predictions on alloys that usually result in poor APDFT predictions. And these machine learning models can now improve these predictions greatly. So to summarize, I've introduced APDFT as a method for high throughput catalyst screening where we can produce a lot of data, making many predictions with a single set of DFT calculations, which can be done inexpensively. Using first order corrections of APDFT, we can see that these errors are large when the transmutations are near the absorbate, and also large when we use a greater NT and delta Z. Due to these errors being very systematic with respect to features, we use machine learning to correct these pred predictions where our models were able to decrease the mean absolute error in some cases by up to an order of magnitude. And from this, we found the most important features used for training were delta Z and NT, and the cases with large delta Z and NT were also the most improved with these corrections. The next steps then would be able to use higher order APDFT predictions so that we can identify which types of interactions are better treated with higher order derivatives and how we may tie this into APDFT's low accuracy of binding energy predictions on alloys made with large delta Z and NT. Finally, if you'd like to see another talk on this work, focus more on the bigger picture, I direct you to Professor John Keith's talk on Tuesday, November 17th. Thank you very much for your time.